statement. Great. As chair of the SAU 21 Joint School Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the SAU 21 Joint School Board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting through dialing the following phone number, 646-876-9923, 646-876-9923, uh, webinar ID 919-1794-1745 and by, okay. or by clicking the following website address, um, www, we got a background noise here. Um, it says zoom.us. Oh, it's listed on the agenda <laughs> as opposed to writing off these. Um, we previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for ac accessing the meeting, including how to access the meeting using Zoom or telephonically. Instructions have also been provided on the web website of SAU21 office at www.sau21.org. If anybody has a problem, please call 603-926-8992, extension 103, or email at revans at sau21.org. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. So I'm gonna call attendance and just make sure your microphone is unmuted so we can hear you. Um, Karen Stanton? Yes. Forrest Carter? Greg Marrow? Greg Parrish? Present. Family in and out of the room. Greg Duffy? Present. Alone. Henry Marsh? Uh, present. Alone. Jessica Brown? Present with family. Jim Keim? Present and alone. John Bailey? Present with family in our room. Leslie LaFond? Present and alone. Mike Rabideau? Present and alone. Rebecca Burdick? Present, family in and out. Sharon Gordon? Present and alone. Tom Von Jess? Present, alone. Heidi Terracina? Present with family in and out. Jason Farias? Present, family in and out. <clears throat> Jennifer Hubbard? Here with family. Kelly Huber. Present with family. Martin Tavishian. Present and alone. Nermina Peterson. Present alone. Tony Delano. Present with family in and out. And Jill Swayze. Present with family in and out. Okay. I have the vote recorded. Or I'm sorry, I have the roll call taken. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh. You want me to start? Everybody sure. chime in? Mm -hmm. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States, States of America, of America and, and to the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands, which it stands. One, one nation, nation, one nation under, God, under God, and it is indivisibly liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. Kind of hard to do that with everybody when, when you hear it in there. <laughs> it's like trying to stay in, in timing, which probably threw it out of timing. Um, all right, great, thank you. Uh, next is the approval of minutes um, for May uh, 26, 2020. I make the motion to accept the minutes. I'll second that. Does anybody have any uh, discussion? Nope. 
Okay, great. Okay, Aaron Stanton. Don't forget to unmute yourselves, everybody. Um, Aaron Stanton. Did we lose Aaron? Yes, she, yes, we did. Okay. Greg Parrish. Uh, yeah. Greg Duffy. Yes. Yes. Henry Marsh. Yes. Jessica Brown. Abstain. Jim Kime. Yes. John Bailey. Yes. Leslie LaFond. Yes. Mike Rabideau. Yes. Rebecca Burdick. Yes. And Sharon Gordon. Abstain. Tom Von Jess. Yes. Heidi Terracina. Yes. Jason Farias. Yes. Jennifer Hubbard. Abstained. Kelly Huber. Did we lose Kelly? Yes, I'm sorry. I couldn't unmute. It wouldn't go. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Martin Tabishian. Abstained. Nermina Peterson. Yes. Tony Delano. Yes. And Jill Swayze. Yes. Okay. I have the vote recorded. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, next, I believe we need to go, um, since we have a few uh, board members who have to leave by 545, we're going to go into non-public to discuss. I, I don't think, I don't, I don't know that we need to, um, unless someone thinks we do. This is the um, proposed agreement, the addendum um, to govern uh, the last, the remote learning period, which has ended with SESPA. Um, it is modeled largely after the same agreement with, with C um, and uh, really just governs their role during, during the remote learning period and the way we would approach it. Um, so if you have questions, we can try to answer, or we can certainly answer them. Um, but again, we were, this was negotiated some time ago and we brought it to the last meeting where we didn't have the quorum of each board to vote on it. Does anyone have any questions or want to discuss? Uh, this will require a vote. If, if, yes. If it requires a vote, um, I want to make a motion to accept the superintendent's recommendation. I have a second. I'll, I'll second, second that. Yeah. Great. Is there any further discussion? I have Henry I making the motion and Aaron Stanton seconding it. Uh, Aaron Stanton? Yes. Greg Parrish? Yes. Greg Duffy? Yes. Henry Marsh? Yes. Jessica Brown? Yes. Jim Kime? Yes. John Bailey? Yes. Leslie LaFond? Yes. Mike Rabideau? Yes. Rebecca Burdick? Yes. Sharon Gordon? Yes. Tom Von Jess? Yes. Heidi Terracina? Yes. Jason Farias? Yes. Jennifer Hubbard? Yes. Kelly Huber? Yes. Martin Tavishian? Yes. Nermina Peterson? Yes. Tony Delano? Yes. And Jill Swayze? Yes. I have the vote recorded. Thank you. Great. Uh, next is the return to school task force update. <clears throat> right. So this is going to be a busy couple of days to just so you um, have the sort of lay of the land on this. Tomorrow morning, we're going to hold a session for employees to go through much of what we're talking with you about tonight. And tomorrow evening, combined with SAU 90, we're going to do a community forum um, in the same sort of format. We're lucky tonight not only to have the three other senior staff members, but Jason Saltmarsh, who's been working with our technology working group, and Donna Couture, who's been working um, with the post-secondary uh, group. So just a couple of, of pieces up front, and then I want to Want, want them to get started with talking to you about the work of their group. First of all, we have a, a pretty significant number of people involved in this initiative and they are doing great work. We have 25 people, I think it is, on the task force itself that both Mike Rabideau and Jim 
Heim sit on, um, a number of other people who are on each of the working groups. And that's been going on for about five weeks now. Um, and they're doing really, really terrific work as you will hear tonight. Um, there is a statewide group um, that, is, that is supposed to be providing some um, sort of framework for us with respect to return to school. Um, we're being told that we will see a draft of that report at the end of June, um, but um, I, I'm, I'm not certain we will. We, we haven't seen anything from the department that's been on time yet, and so I, I really question whether we will get something from them by the end of June, more like mid-July, I, I, would, I would guess. Um, we'll, we'll see um, some of their work. Um, we're also talking with the districts around us because as you're gonna hear a lot of this, this work, we'd like to try to coordinate it. We have lots of teachers who live in other districts and so it makes sense that we're in a region as much on the same page as we, as we possibly can be. So all of this work has been geared toward trying to go back to school, a physical presence in schools in the fall. I think what you're going to hear from my colleagues is some of the um, some of the concerns about that, um, some of the parameters that are currently in place. We don't know if they'll change, that make that very very difficult. Um, and so what we're thinking about again, still dealing with those various scenarios of back in school, full time, on remote learning full time, and then the various ways of looking at hybrid models. In between and fourth, and and the one if you're and if you're reading a lot about this, and I'm, I'm guessing that many of you are, um, this idea of rolling closures, which is getting an awful lot of attention now in terms of of some some thought about when we might see second second waves and and things like that. So all of this is really geared toward coming back, but we have an awful lot of questions, and tonight is not meant to have great answers and a plan to put in front of you because we don't have it. We're not there yet. Um, in my discussion with the SST superintendents, the superintendents from the districts uh, around here, Sanborn, Exeter, um, and, 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 and others who send their, Raymond, um, who send their kids to that vocational uh, career and tech center, you know, most of them are shooting for mid to late July to really know what their plan is that they're gonna put in place. And that doesn't mean there isn't lots of work to be done in the meantime, um, but, but really in terms of being able to finalize a plan, that's their timeline. And we're certainly gonna wait until we see the, the state timeline as well. So tonight, tomorrow morning, tomorrow night are meant as much as anything to sort of hear your questions, gather some feedback. And so for you to hear, I guess, also where, where we are with this, with this work. So, um, most of you, all of you know uh, Caroline and David and, and Matt. You don't all necessarily know Jason Saltmarsh, Saltmarsh, who's the technology director at Winnicott High School, and Donna Couture, who works with our ELO program at the high school, who have signed on to, to do this work, and they are amazing. So um, we thought we'd start tonight with Donna's group, because Donna's group's work is a little bit different and one that sometimes doesn't get as much thought in terms of return to school. This is the group that's really looking at our students who are graduating and going on to post-secondary, uh, and by the way, the group that will be seniors next year, and the variety of challenges that they're gonna face as a result of what we're seeing all over the post-secondary uh, world, whether it's college or the world of work or, or all of those pieces. So, Donna Couture. Thank you very much, Dr. Lupini. Um, so what I can share with you today is, is basically an overview, as I'm sure the detailed information is gonna be shared with you at some point. Um, I will say that we have a really great group, um, mostly made up of um, Winnicott High School staff, given the nature of the work that we were focused on. Um, we're largely looking at the class of 2020 um, and the class of 2021. So that being said, we had mostly guidance counselors on our membership. We have our transition coordinator from Winnicunit. We have our adult ed program representation, um, the alumni association. We have our class advisors. 
And we do have uh, administration on the team. That being said, we have some Southampton representation as well. The principal, Walter Houston, was there to just um, make sure that we are keeping track of the few students we have in Southampton um, as well. So I think what we focused on initially was conversations around how drastically the COVID pandemic has changed the landscape for post-secondary education, as well as our workforce and employment outlook for our students. And, you know, as we think about justifying the work that we were doing, it was really apparent to us that certainly there's no denying that our graduates are experiencing tremendous disappointment and missed milestones and changes to things as, um, as you know, you can imagine with graduation and whatnot. So, you know, unfortunately, though, we all recognize the fact that that disappointment may continue a bit in the fall, because just as we were trying to figure out what's going to what our school is going to look like, their um, higher education experience is sort of left out there as well. They, they don't know what to expect, and they're trying to make decisions as to what comes next, next for them. Um, we recognize, too, that there are students who, you know, because of the pandemic, may choose to stay close to home, um, may change their plans for that reason. They may choose to go to a community college where they might not have chosen that to begin with. Some may choose to um, take a gap year. Um, and others who may have been going into employment um, now are sort of left with, with um, those questions as well, what comes next for us. Um, we're sort of keeping an eye on statistics. So for example, um, we know that 25% of our young people in the United States ages 18 to 24 have lost their job due to the pandemic. We also know that, you know, regardless of the pandemic, there are bleak um, outlooks for students who maybe attend community college and try to transfer into a four year program. Um, those numbers are very low. I think 45% of all students who um, go to community college actually successfully complete. So facing all of this, we recognize that we need to um, pay attention now more than ever in what those issues are for our students, our graduates, and how are we going to respond to them. So our primary goals for um, our, our post-secondary task force is to make sure that our graduates achieve what their post-secondary plans are. The, the other thing we want to make sure that we're doing is taking in all of this information, everything that we know from the class of 2020 and applying that to the class of 2021. So some of the things that we are actively putting in place at the moment um, is we had posed, a, recommended um, an alumni relations coordinator. So this would be a short term position um, that we're hoping to put in place that's going to help us analyze the data that we have on our current students. And so that could be surveys, that could be um, you know, documentation of interviews that counselors have done, that our adult ed program have done with our students. So we're looking at the 180 day school graduates and the 28 night school graduates. Um, so we want to make sure that one, at this point in time, we know where their students are going and uh, what their plans are. But then we also want to resurvey and re-reach out to them um, in the fall to figure out if they've achieved um, those plans. And so along the way, we're going to learn just how to support those students. And so the work that the committee has also done is to put together a multi-tiered system of support, a structure that will obviously provide as many resources as possible to all of our graduates, but also target um, the resources for, for students who are declaring that they have some um, concerns or have some questions. Um, and then most importantly, we want to provide an intensive support structure for those students who might need some additional counseling um, to sort of group and make sure that they can be successful. Um, and that's where we sort of um, have planned to engage the adult ed program in that process. So that's sort of um, our focus for the most part at, as we stand with the class of 2020. We spent a considerable amount of time discussing the class of 2021, which will follow suit with what you're gonna hear from um, our other committee chair people. We sort of took our plans and, and, and sectioned them out 
depending on what that scenario might look like in the fall. So as Dr. Lupini discussed, there are a number of different scenarios at play, and we wanted to make sure that we had plans to, um, for our class of 2021, depend, no matter what the scenario is. And so, for example, we were looking at things like we want to make sure that we are minimizing the disruption to their post-secondary planning. So things like mini college fairs, those happen throughout the fall. How do we continue to make sure students have access to colleges, to admissions counselors? We even have several of our larger employers that come to those, military recruiters and the like. Um, usually come in person. So if we aren't able to accomplish that, um, we have discussed putting a plan in place in order to make that happen uh, remotely as well. Um, and we've done the same things for things like parent nights that usually happen, um, meetings with students individually, meetings with students in groups. So we've gone through it at, in, in pretty um, great detail in figuring out how to best support each of those scenarios and making sure those activities um, still continue to happen for our students. We also looked further out. We actually looked um, to some of the larger events that happen in the, in the January on um, and our career fair, our alumni fair, our transition fair, for example, all of those things happen usually um, around January, April time. Um, and so, you know, we haven't put a ton of detail into planning that far out, but we do know enough to make sure that contingencies um, are uh, possible if they're needed. Because um, again, our primary focus is making sure there's minimal disruption to the planning for our class of 2021. Um, some of the things that struck me when we were discussing this um, amongst our committee members was um, that, you know, since March, we've really been in crisis mode with our students and everything that we've had to um, make happen for our class of 2020 has been, for the most part, reactionary. Um, and that's necessary for where we are now. But I think moving forward, the primary goal of this response team is to make sure that we're being proactive, make sure that we're planning for as many different scenarios as possible. So our class of 2021 still can have a very fruitful year as far as their planning goes. Um, and also keeping them well informed. It's really important to us that we stay up to date with as much um, as the changes are happening. Um, it's very rapid, as you can imagine, in the higher ed world at this point, as well as employment. And um, we want to make sure that we're providing them with the most up-to-date resources as possible. I think that pretty much covers everything. Thank you, Donna. That was great. Thank you so much. Do, does anyone have a, any questions for Donna? No okay. questions, but if I might just yes. thank you for heading up this um, um, part that you're in. I really appreciate that to know that you're out there doing that. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. I have one quick question, if I may, Dr. Please. Lupini. Please. No. So a question came up the other day as I was talking with uh, one of my neighbors about who's got a graduating um, senior about uh, kids that may, with students that may defer going to college this year because they're unsure about what's going to happen next year and therefore what the placement would happen for 2021 students as well as 2020 students are because if everyone ends up going deferring a year and then trying to get in the following year it creates kind of a, a crunch has there been any conversation either from um, the higher edu education institutions or um, you know on, on the southeastern to discuss that and what is it what kind of impact does it have on our students yeah it's a great question donna do you want to well i'll just say that that yes there there's there's so much out there right now and how the higher educational facilities are are responding to the potential of students not coming back or um, delaying a deferring for a year and what all of that means. And I think the financial implications of what that means for those institutions is, is said to, um, it's going to impact even beyond the next couple of years. We could see the impacts of this six years out um, for many of our students. I think that there are some um, lower tier schools that um, 
are going to be primarily affected by this situation. And so there are going to be some institutions that are going to go out of business. I, I think that's the prediction. Um, I think our top tier, even second tier schools probably will be less affected. Um, but I think that students are asking the right questions, parents are asking the right questions, and that's if I'm going to go into a remote learning setting, does that mean my um, financial obligations are reduced? Does that mean, um, you know, my family can make different decisions as far as um, whether I could be there in person or remotely or a combination of the two. All of that affects the bottom line, I think, for these institutions. And certainly that's going to affect them for years to come. Um, I don't think we're going to, uh, I don't think we're going to know the answer to that for some time. They, they are largely, they came out of the gate saying we're returning in the fall, right? Mm -hmm. Be because because they had to say that, <laughs> because otherwise they lead to all these questions that Donna just posed, like, you know, like one Harvard professor said, we better figure this out before our pr prospective students figure out that they're paying um, $60,000 for the University of Cambridge or, uh, you know, the University of Phoenix, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so, so, so of course they had, and now they're getting a little more nuanced about it at, at Northeastern and BU, for example, they're saying you can come back face to face, you can do remote or you can do, re do remote from on campus. We're going to offer all of those alternatives. Of course, the professors are saying we don't know how we're going to do that, but right, but, but that's the, um, but that's the model. Um, so I think, I think where we're going to start to hear, figure out the answers to questions like you've posed is later on in the summer. Yeah. when they actually see what those numbers look like, whether when we see whether if someone defers, you know, they're probably going to guarantee them a spot next year when they want to come, but do they take someone off the wait list? What about the schools that don't have wait lists available to them? What's going to happen to them? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we think August, September into the fall, we're going to start to see some, some, if you pay attention to the people who are studying this, there could be some really significant shifts start in higher education including the question you've posed. Yeah. So I know we don't have the answer yet and that's okay, but Donna, to your point, if some uh, colleges end up going um, out of business because of the, the crunch, right? Then the financial stress, then there's gonna be even fewer seats. And then you've got this compounding problem of, of students choosing to defer and fewer seats. And what does that mean for you know, graduates of 2021, 2022, 2020, et cetera. And that's the, the question, and I don't have the answer, and it's okay, yeah, we don't. If, How do we fix that down the road, right? What do we do to prep our kids? Yeah, if this, if this is an area that interests you, there are some people writing about this seismic shift that's coming. One, Tom, Tom, one of them proposes that the answer is going to be, because it's already starting in higher ed, that the Harvards and the world are going to couple up with, um, with tech companies and start a lower tier, lower price point um, univer uh, offering. Um, to take those seats, to fill in that void, that that's coming and it's coming sooner. This just, it was coming anyhow, but this is like an accelerant on that model. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the, as I said, a lot of the people who write about this say there are some really major shifts. And I think the reason we started this group is we just don't want to see our kids get caught in the middle of that shift. We want to be able to support them wherever we can. And I will say one last thing. Um, we are in actually um, better shape than many high schools in the state, um, merely because of the capacity we have to support those students who are off to college and careers. Melinda Schaffner is our college counselor, as you know, and um, we are one of two high schools in the state that, that have that position. And so the benefit in a situation like this is that that individual can dedicate a considerable amount of time making sure that she's doing the proper research and keeping up to date with all of these changes that are happening so rapidly. Um, and so uh, the onus of a lot of this work does fall on her shoulders, um, but I think that it's well managed. I do think that, you know, capacity becomes a question, which is why we proposed um, the addition of that short term position. Um, but it's certainly something that we see, see as a silver lining in some of this is that we do have that position at the high school. Thanks, Donna. You're going to, by the way, you're going to hear a couple of these uh, ideas about short term positions, uh, and et cetera. We, we are work, the, the groups are working through those. We have CARES money available in a number of our districts that will be able to support 
um, some of that. And these are conversations that the committees are also, that these working groups are also having with the principals. So thank you, Donna. Uh, Dr. Lupini. Yes. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm on the executive collegiate board and uh, we have meetings via Zoom uh, once a week and they're really in flux all over the nation from, because we have board members from California to the East Coast. And um, as she said, many of the colleges may not be around. And looking at a sports entity, uh, the number of sports that are, are dropping or colleges are dropping the sports, uh, almost every college that we're looking at right now, they're they're dropping anywhere from four to seven collegiate sports. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. And uh, the kids that want to defer, they can get a letter if the college will let them defer for mm -hmm. a year. Uh, I haven't heard of one yet for two years, but uh, one year. And the, what they've got to look for is that financial aid, as well as any scholarship or direct grant before they make a commitment. That's Henry, I thought, of, I thought of you early on in this, you were one of the first per people to sort of clue me in on, on some of this. Um, it was very early on, on in this. And I thought of you about three weeks after this started when Brown University dropped 11 sports. Right. Um, right, 11 non-revenue generating sports were gone in one day um, at Brown. So it's, 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 it's happening. Yeah. Um, so, thank you, Donna. Terrific. Dr. Um, Lupini, Greg Parrish. Yes, Greg. Um, the, these temporary positions, will they, which entity will they fall under? When it come at so, the SAU? So um, it, it, how, it, de it depends on the position, Greg. We're still working through some of that, but we'll have a proposal. I mean, this okay. one obviously will probably, will, will probably come out of CARES monies uh, for Winnicunit but we have some others that we'll look at in different ways. And some of them may be shared because of the small amounts of money that a district like yours has. We may need to combine them in some way. And, and is there any conversation that some of these temporary positions could become semi-permanent? Um, there's, there's at least one that may be, and, and Donna and I have talked about whether this one down the road remains temporary or not. But you, so, so that's a yes. Okay, thank you. But but not without us figuring out how to fund them appropriately. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Donna. Um, so I'm going to go now to Dr. Hobbs, who's going to talk about return to instruction. Great. Um, all right. Well, good news is you've already heard my spiel a couple times. <laughs> uh, the, the difficult news is this represents uh, several weeks worth of work uh, from 14 different committee members, all working remotely. We have a 25 page document as of now with, with um, recommendations. Um, I, it's not the place to go through that right now. I just wanna give you um, the ability to visualize kind of where we're going with our group, what the conversations and the touch points uh, we're having in our group are. Um, so first of all, I, I'll just echo Dr. Lupini, what our, what our emphasis, what our goal is, and especially considering the trajectory of, of kind of the state right now, our goal is to get kids back in school in a safe way, right? Uh, we wanna find ways for kids and teachers to, to do the teaching and learning uh, that we, we know works. Um, so that, so that's, the end, that's the goal. Um, our group started with some conversations around that kind of fourth model, that hybrid model. Um, and I just want to kind of be transparent about it. We found it uh, very tricky in a number of different ways. Um, the hybrid model meeting maybe going every other, students would go every other day, uh, half the student body would go every other week, et cetera. Um, but from, and I think I'm sure this board brought it up, I think from an economics standpoint, from a workforce standpoint, um, it would be very difficult for moms and dads to schedule uh, being home for kids uh, on these toggled schedules and on these back and forth. Um, uh, we're having those, if we choose one model, Portsmouth chooses a different model, uh, becomes wildly complicated in terms of what our ask of parents would be. Uh, so that, so that didn't really get a lot of traction in our group. And I wanted to make sure I put that on the table for everybody to, to hear and to listen to and understand. So basically our group starting really with three models, right? We, we, we have a face-to-face -face model, 
uh, we have a remote model. And then we have what looks like more and more of a possibility, which is a rolling closure kind of a model. Where we go back in face to face and at some point we have to pull out or toggle to a remote. Um, so that's what we're looking at. Um, so I'll just kind of give you the highlights of a face to face and then the highlights of a remote. Um, and then of course, obviously toggling back and forth would be the rolling closure. So uh, face to face, just so you can visualize it would look like a school day. Um, with obviously safety provisions uh, put into our buildings and, and put into our transportation and, and facilities, et cetera. Um, that might include modifying our section sizes. So we'll look at all the classes going, block three, block four, whatever, and see which ones are the large ones, whether or not we can move them to, to larger spaces or whether or not we can uh, use our staff a little bit more efficiently in order to kind of flatten out uh, our student body throughout that time. Also looking at larger spaces within the school, right? Um, what, how can we use our library media center? How can we use our cafeteria in ways that allow groups of students to, to congregate, congregate separately? Uh, just getting creative uh, with physical space. Uh, I know I've heard, at least from Northampton, on the out, use of outdoor spaces as well. Um, and I think that's, that's certainly on the table uh, with our committee. Um, obviously, we also are talking about the PPE that's associated with, with those kind of scenarios. I'll defer, I'll, I'll let Matt kind of address that, but, but that's part of our conversation. And I think um, I would be remiss if I didn't emphasize the SEL component that is going to be, it's going to take place as a result. If we go back face to face, we're going to have to understand that students aren't going to learn unless they feel safe and unless they feel comfortable. Um, so that's been a driving conversation, and, I'm, and thankfully so, in our group, uh, in face-to-face -face scenario. So second, in a face-to-face -face scenario, um, in anticipation of whatever you know, the future brings, um, there, there needs to be an expectation that all classes have an online space from the outset. Uh, in other words, if, if we have a rolling closure that comes, we're gonna, be, we're gonna need to be prepared to toggle from our face-to-face -face instruction uh, into our online space. Um, also, you know, if we're face-to-face, -face, we do need to understand that there are some students that are gonna have to work from home. They're uh, medically fragile or for this reason or that, they're not gonna be able to participate in that face-to-face -face instruction. So we need to make sure we make that online accommodation for those kids. Um, so in terms of curriculum, uh, the current curriculum emphasis in a face-to-face -face scenario uh, really uh, emphasizes um, alignment, uh, making sure we address student gaps in learning, uh, making sure we offer teachers uh, the opportunity to communicate vertically. Uh, you know, a fifth grade teacher talking to a sixth grade teacher about what did you cover, what didn't you cover, um, those general things, but also about um, kind of SEL needs or attendance needs or anything that, that teachers need to know as a result of uh, remote learning um, to better serve our kids. So we need to make sure that we bake that into our face-to-face -face environment, right? Um, and then I, I think there's another thing that, that, our, that our group is actively talking about. I wish I could say we had solid answers on this, but we don't. Um, and, and the notion is that we need to understand that there are going to be pockets of not only students but also teachers that for whatever reason if we're in face-to-face -face scenario are not going to be able to come back to the building uh, and that really poses a, a complicated question for us because um, obviously teachers are tied to their certification or a particular grade level and it's logistically very different very difficult to plan a school day uh, with those, with not knowing a those numbers or b not knowing who they are, so it's been a it's been a consistent ask from our group to find out to get a shape uh, and size of the number of teachers as well as students uh, that might not be able to return to school. You know, the other the other consideration there is the pocket of teachers or students that can't return to school might be a fluid pocket, right? Uh, so that that number or demographic may shift throughout the course of whatever remote learning we have to do or whatever face-to-face -face learning we have to do. Um, so it, it really is a moving target that we're trying to get our arms around. But those are the issues that we're kind of trying to, to talk through right now in our group. Um, with respect to uh, teachers or students that might be at home, we I know Jason loves the term room and Zoom. But um, we've talked actively and we've talked also with, with the teachers union about how we can start looking at recording sessions that happen during the school day face-to-face -face for the consumption of students who are 
at home or for can't, who can't actually attend it's the synchronous environment uh, for one reason or another. Uh, there, are, there are, you know, a host of complicated issues there, um, but those are some of the um, things that we're trying to unpack with both, both technology, union, and curricularly. Um, PD wise. So face-to-face -face scenarios, um, we, we are going to need to offer a lot of professional development for teachers, and I'll just give you a taste. This is where we really link up with the other groups. Um, we are going to need to understand, teachers are going to need to do some work around SEL needs of our students. What are the social, emotional, you know, this has been a trauma. What are the needs students are going to have when they come back from this traumatic experience? We, we need to have that conversation as a staff. We need to have conversations around operations. What are, the, what are the safety protocols that we are putting in place? Um, how do teachers react to students who are not complying with those safety protocols? Uh, we need a, a conversation around some of those operational logistical considerations, right? Um, we're gonna need to have a conversation around technology, um, obviously, and um, we are also, I hate to put it last, but we're also gonna have to have that curricular conversation, that traditional professional development uh, conversation with our teachers because we're coming off uh, kind of a, a unique time for our kids and for our, for, our, for our teachers. So I hope that allows you to kind of visualize the conversations of, around face to face. I'm going to jump over to remote and then I know this is topical, but uh, we can dive into any details or questions that we have. So um, the remote learning environment, if we have to toggle uh, to, you know, role enclosure, uh, we're going to need to have a remote schedule in our back pocket or a remote approach in our back pocket uh, that students are aware of, parents are aware of, and teachers are aware of. Um, secondly, is that remote schedule needs to be a schedule. I think if there's one thing we learned uh, throughout this spring, it's that designated times and designated expectations for synchronous instruction are, impo are an important part of remote learning. The other thing, and this is just good best practice in teaching, is interaction. Um, you know, it's, it's very, it's, it's a minimal way to describe teaching when you're talking about delivery of and uh, communication with kids and having that two way and learning. That's really important. And that's something that's coming up um, in the group. Am I coming across? It says my internet connection is unstable. Okay. I can hear you. All right. Thank you. But I'm unstable as well. <laughs> So there are some things we learned around best practice toggling to a remote scenario uh, potentially in the fall, right? And they're not necessarily uh, the same as best practices in face-to-face -face instruction. I'll, tell, I'll give you a few examples. Um, the group's been playing around with schedules that emphasize longer class periods. Uh, that, you know, that work on project-based learning, that allow kids to go out, uh, maybe spend some non-screen time uh, doing research projects, et cetera, and bringing them back to a group. Um, we're looking at um, the best scenarios that we've had, at least K through eight in the remote learning environment, have been, have been teams, have been team-oriented um, kind of digital spaces where we have a specialist involved. We have a case manager involved. We have a number of teachers uh, collaborating in, in, on, in on the same kind of digital space together. Um, also, we have the inclusion or integration of unified arts in there. Um, those have been the most um, productive ways that we've kind of scaffolded uh, remote learning. And I think that a lot of the schedules that our group have drafted or, or suggested as model schedules emphasize those points. Um, and if, you, if you're hearing this, you're also hearing that a face-to-face -face schedule for many of our schools might be different than a remote schedule. And if we do have to toggle back and forth, we're going to have to, we're going to have to understand that, you know, the schedule implications of that. Obviously, there's a lot more um, flexibility in a remote learning environment. Um, you can do those A days, B days, et cetera, in a remote learning environment. Um, so our group has spent some time putting together some sample schedules, but we found kind of our limits as a, as a committee because there are uh, schedules, scheduling is so idiosyncratic across our districts um, that we, we just couldn't afford to go down that rabbit hole for each one of our districts. So we did have just some best practices and some models that we put forward for that. Um, given a remote scenario, another thing that I wanted to make sure to mention to you guys is we're talking more and more about um, the necessity for um, teachers to access the building 
uh, during a remote learning scenario. So that might include a science teacher or a lab-based teacher recording a lesson in his or her classroom uh, to be broadcast out to kids just because of the physical requirements that you need in a lab or a jewelry class or whatever the case may be, right? Um, we understand also that there needs to be a physical transfer of materials from time to time, whether that means progress reports or whether that means manipulatives for learning um, or whether it means just work, books, that kind of thing. Uh, we're we're going to need to articulate some sort of process or some sort of mechanism for a physical transfer of materials between the school and the home, given remote learning. And then um, obviously there we, we're back to a host of uh, concerns in remote learning around what is what does a classroom look like what are the minimum requirements for teachers in terms of hours and in terms of, of, of the teaching schedule um, we've drafted minimum expectations for synchronous learning uh, we've actually broken that out from elementary middle and high school um, but those are the conversations that we're having just kind of um, trying to pick those apart and find any gaps that we we see uh, at least in philosophy um, I, I don't need to go through the professional development for remote learning because there's a, there's a lot of it. Um, however, one thing we wouldn't have to worry about in remote learning is the operations side. We wouldn't have to worry about the physical environment. So that's a, that's a silver lining, right? Um, so I, that was an attempt to kind of give you the, the bird's eye view of our conversations, our priorities. Um, and I'm happy to entertain kind of questions because if, if, if I don't know the answer, if we haven't discussed it, we probably should discuss it. So I'm, I'm open to your questions or concerns uh, as we move forward. Um, so thanks, I'll pause right there. Dave, Thank Greg you. Parrish. Yep. Um, in your statistics from the last few months, have you been able to identify which grades have struggled with remote learning? And if so, how, how are your conversations evolved moving forward with that? Yeah, so um, the, the first one that jumps out is the, the little kids, like, you know, K through two kids. That is a really difficult environment to run remotely. Um, and so, yeah, we have, we have discussed that and, and we've actually discussed it in terms of require, or requirements, best practices for teachers um, for synchronous instruction. Look, it's just not fair to hold a, a first grader to a screen for, you know, two hours a day, right? right. So, um, so we're, we're looking actively at shorter times uh, spread out throughout the course of the day. Um, we're looking at the, um, the entity of morning meeting um, so that students can see each other um, as well as their teacher and, and feel connected to something. We're also looking at um, Defining asynchronous, uh, sorry, defining synchronous learning is a little bit more broadly. And what I mean by that is picture a classroom, right? You're, you're actually very rarely broadcasting to the entire classroom. Uh, as an alternative, you're usually working with small groups. You might be working, you know, one-on-one -on -one with a kid. Um, so we're trying to articulate priorities around, you know, what works in the classroom, um, but just doing it in a digital space as opposed to um, trying to, to, modify everything to adhere to our hourly requirement for digital learning because it's, it's just not apples to apples. Um, and I, I think the only other in terms of grade levels, um, I think I, I would say that the it's less about grade level and more about the team based approach. That's been a consistent theme for us. The, the lone wolves in remote learning, you know, the teacher that just does their own thing has their own encapsulated class have been less successful, broadly speaking. Um, than the people, at least K through eight, that have really integrated um, a lot of supports within a digital platform. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Um, Becky Berta here. I just have a question. So if either of these, you know, if any of the scenarios are sort of long term, have you guys talked about what um, the social sort of impact on students and, you know, even from the younger grades to even the, you know, the class of 2021 now moving on, you know, next year, possibly into college, you know, so how have you talked about what that looks like for, for kids? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I'll preface this by saying Caroline is the expert on this stuff, and that's kind of been the uh, one of the guiding principles of of, of that group. 
Um, from our committee standpoint, one of the things that we've really kind of circled around is um, with respect to this question is um, the ability to provide closure to the 2019-2020 the school year. Um, I know we've, talk, we've had some conversations with SAU 90 about the potential of looping. I don't, I don't think looping is part of our roadmap for our committee. However, um, the idea that we might want to spend some time with the previous year's teacher or create a vertical connection between last year's teacher and this year's teacher is a really important one that we want to emphasize. I just feel like they're, you know, the, the kids are just losing a lot of their social skills and social aspects of, of being in groups and, and being in a building. You know, I just, I mean, even if they, or, or how are kids going to deal with this socially when they move back into it, if they have to wear masks and there's all this other safety protocol inside the buildings, you know, just, just curious if you guys have talked about that as well. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I'll say this, remote learning is not face-to-face -face instruction. Our goal is to, to be face-to-face -face and to have all those things. I'm really happy though, that in our conversations, we've recognized that back and forth, that community atmosphere is something that's like a very, very high priority for every single person on our team. Um, and it, I think it's manifested out in our plans. Okay, good. Anything else for Dr. Hobbs? I just have two quick questions. Um, Dr. Hobbs, we have a, we've got a really great um, team of EAs. And uh, as you're going through the planning, have you, uh, I'm sure you have, but um, some of the EAs help teach in the entire classroom. Some of them are one-to-one. -one. Um, can you share a little bit about how they may be interacting with students and how we're gonna leverage them as a resource to get through? Right. Thank you for that. That's a good one. Um, we actually have an EA on our working group um, and she's been, she's been great trying to give us angles and, and give us um, ways in which they can be helpful. I, I think that if I'm transparent here, I think we underutilized some of our classroom um, supports this spring. Um, and I think, I think we can frame uh, those classroom supports uh, in, a, in a more effective way in the fall. Now, I would differentiate between face-to-face -face and remote in this. Um, in a face-to-face -face scenario, there are, there are, you know, schedules that EAs would have to keep. However, um, one of the things we've talked about is a lot of, uh, and this is in the assessment group, this is assessing for learning group. Um, is it possible? So a lot of our assessments that we use uh, with, with, especially with our younger students, literacy assessments, et cetera, are just, are guided they're like a one-on-one -on -one guided assessment. Um, if we can leverage EAs or support staff in order to, to help guide those students through those assessments, uh, it really might help our, our whole schedule in terms of what our specialists are able to do. Um, that becomes problematic, obviously, in the remote setting. Um, the, you know, the other thing is, and it's not a small issue, is uh, we've talked around kind of the room and Zoom scenario where you know, we might be in a scenario in a class where a teacher's teaching and they have to be recorded or they have to, you know, share their voice with students who are working at home in some sort of capacity uh, using any type of support staff or maybe even student supports uh, to, to facilitate some of that. Um, those those are kind of a couple of the ideas that we batted around with with you with um, um, classroom supports, educational associates. Um, but yeah. Thank you. And then my other quick question is, you mentioned that there were some complications around recording if some of the um, education need to be delivered asynchronous, asynchronously. Are those complications, legal complications, contractual complications, comfort and training complications, kind of what, can you dive into that a little bit? To can I answer yes? yes? I can do that one. Yeah, 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 yeah right on, exactly. Yeah, the answer is yeah. yes. I mean, there are there are collective bargaining implications, and there are legal app implications, and and right, and some and some comfort of, of of doing it applications, and they they you can't pull them apart really easily. So those are things that we'll have to have a conversation uh, about. Thank you, mm -hmm. David Greg Parrish again. Um, many of us participating today have kids in the system. And so when you say remote learning, we have a general und uh, understanding of what we're about to experience. But those kindergarten parents whose oldest child is now first.
we, we lost you, Greg. Um, Greg, I, th I think, oh, you're moving now. We still there I am. So, so should I just, I, I think I know where the question's going. Should I, can I yeah, follow go this? Ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> So I think I think the question is um, how, talking about onboarding uh, incoming kindergarten students uh, and and families really. Let's be honest; it's about families uh, with our practices. Correct. With what to expect? Yeah. Um, so I, it's been a component. You know, this is the twenty-five page document, right? It's each one of our working groups has a component that specifically addresses uh, parent outreach. Now, a lot of them have to do with um, provision of feedback for students, uh, how and when that takes place, um, how we're doing grading assessment, that kind of thing. Um, with the younger grades, however, it, it, it has, there are um, recommendations that have to do with just outreach and um, whether it's a video tutorial or whether it's a family outreach the way VLAX does where the whole family has to come in and do a Zoom. Um, those kind of recommendations are baked into Spe specifically the younger grades. So yes, it has been addressed. It's been addressed in recommendations, not in um, anything more than more forceful language than that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Huff. Oh, sorry. So I know you've given some thought already, but I just wanna preface, I just wanna prepare you to be prepared to answer these questions as they come up. Um, it really has to do with how we gauge success of remote learning, assuming that some level of remote learning is going to take place next year. Um, in terms of how we objectively quantify that success and adjust on the fly where we feel we're falling short. So it, it's both being prepared to answer those kinds of questions and offer, you know, if we need to invest in professional development for teachers, or if you need support from this board to be successful in that regard, um just be ahead of the curve in terms of asking for what you need got it and thank you thanks john okay so i'm going to turn this now over to dr eric killian thank you very much um i'll try to be um succinct with what time dr hobbs has Sorry. left us <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, okay, so my group was crisis response, the crisis response working group, and I was, uh, it was my pleasure and honor to lead this group. I had a fantastic group of people from all of our districts, including board member, uh, administrators, um, counselors, teachers, um, just a fantastic um, representation across our districts. So crisis response is about mental health and wellness, short term and long term. So we're perhaps the group that is the least scenario dependent in that we would not take away anything in any given scenario that we're recommending um, to support mental health and wellness across our groups. Um, however, we would add to the crisis response if and when we go back into buildings. We will go back someday. Uh, we just don't know when. So at that time, crisis response is the piece that would really step into play. Um, our charge was about creating supportive learning environments where all students and adults can enhance their social and emotional um, knowledge, competencies, and feel a sense of belonging and to heal from all that they have gone through and also to thrive. So as a guiding document, we used um, CASEL, an initial guide to leveraging social emotional learning as you prepare to reopen and renew your school community. So they, they release an, an initial guidance, but they will have um, comprehensive guidance um, at the end of June, which I look forward to and to calibrate our work against that. But even with the initial, with the initial um, guide, our subgroups aligned with their um, criteria, their critical actions. So our three groups, our subgroups, were around students, around staff, and around crisis response. So we we're fortunate to have built a foundation of social emotional learning at SAU 21, as you know, through our SEL leadership team, our professional development, and our priorities and our goals. Um, so we did um, reach out to our SEL 
our SAU wide team and they gave us a lot of fantastic um, input and contributions to this group. Um, the recommendations include, and these were consistent across our subgroups, establishing building level social emotional support teams uh, to assess the supports available to staff and students and to build capacity with what we have in buildings and to see where we have gaps and challenges and where we're strong. So we agreed to use common language, the castle um, competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making um, as a way to um, speak consistently and um, uh, and to be relevant in all that we do across our districts, including SAU 90. Uh, we'll be building supports, um, putting supports in place um, as we look to professional development uh, for staff and the tiers of support for students, as I said, long term and short term. And I'll outline how we, we um, overlap with some of our working groups and existing groups that we have across our SAU. So the student group focused on creating emotionally and physically safe, supportive and engaging learning environments and to promote students' social and emotional development. So they, we, but that subgroup oh, has an overlay with post, the post-secondary working group, as you heard Donna talk about a multi-tiered system of support, as well as the Seacoast care team that looks to um, hear and understand and connect resources to kids who are experiencing um, very risky behaviors. So the social emotional, the student um, social emotional team subgroup, um, they recommend social emotional support teams to assess the multi-tiered systems of support within buildings for students. That would be their prime, primary charge. Um, they have developed a whole building um, district self-assessment to that end. So when we, our, our keyword is pivot, when we pivot to principals and they, they take our, our work and we work with principals this summer, um, given all of these recommendations, um, one of the first things that we recommend is to build that team, although several of our buildings already have such teams, um, but they will be assessing what supports they have in their buildings. Um, so they'll use that multi-tiered systems of support, sometimes called MTSS rubric, along with screening results um, that will allow buildings to make decisions moving forward. So we're recommending that we screen students um, as far as their um, mental and behavior intervention um, status um, this summer and throughout the year by asking students questions and parents and teachers. So this team has um, outlined a plan how we can do that throughout the year to and, and to use that data in line um, with the um, the building level data to make recommendations um, um, to to make sure that all the tiers are are fully um, at their capacity in the buildings. Um, in addition, um, they're recommending a care coordinator position. So this position would coordinate all of this data um, and it would be consistent across district, districts and to make recommendations accordingly. Um, so they would support the initial and implementation of the universal needs assessment throughout the year for the student social emotional mental health care. They'd manage the results um, and assess what barriers and assets each district needed. They would sit on each district's social emotional team to support them in that way. Um, and they would also um, work, um, work vertically so that, you know, the, the teams at Winnicott are aware of what's going on in the K-8 schools and vice versa. The second subgroup um, is for the adults. So the staff mental health and wellness subgroup um, their charge was to design opportunities for the adults to connect, to heal, and to cultivate their own competencies for social emotional learning. Their overlay is with the return to instruction group, as you heard Dr. Hobbs talk about social emotional professional development, as well as the considerations we need to have for staff as they're coming back into buildings or continuing with remote instruction. Um, and as I said, there's an overlap with the 
SAU, SEL leadership team, um, because the, the SEL leadership team's charge has been all along, how can we support staff, the, the staff's mental health? Because what we know is that um, when staff are, are supported, then they can support their students. So a couple things that the staff group um, really, um, they decided early on was that remote instruction is the new initiative meeting students where they are and instructing them accordingly. Um, taking into consideration things like getting back into buildings could, in and of itself can be a stressful event. Um, and um, so we need to make sure that we're taking these things into, into consideration um, as we're reopening schools. Um, just uh, last week or the week before, um, we, um, we sent out a compassion fatigue self-reflection tool to all staff and with some follow-up questions to gain an understanding where the teachers are and what they're feeling. Um, so we've received some, some interesting results, um, although not surprising, these results reflected isolation, loneliness, and staff um, saying that they're craving connection. Um, and what we read from the research is that connection is the antidote for isolation and loneliness. So our charge with this group is to create opportunities for connection for staff. So we'll need to start and end with professional development for supporting staff, um, whether that means um, during, you know, um, uh, the beginning of the school year, throughout the school year, having open time for staff to get used to being back together um, when we are back in buildings, um, but also having an approach and a philosophy of, of resiliency and supporting each other, um, given everything that everybody has had to deal with. Um, so we'll be developing or supporting the development of targeted professional development for connection and for reflection. In addition, there were requests for a continuation of self-care, um, online opportunities. Um, people were very interested in that and um, supported that, embraced that, yoga, meditation. So there was an easily accessible opportunity for everyone to engage in, that, in those self-care activities. So that will be ongoing, just a phenomenal group of people who worked on that. Um, and then finally, the crisis response working group, subgroup, part of our crisis response group, um, has an overlay with operations and with safety and security task force. So this team is about how do we, um, how do we respond to crises uh, for mental health considerations, um, this, this current long, longer term crises, and then, then also to be prepared for crises in the future. So this team did a few things. They created and shared a listing of mental health, social, emotional, and recreational referral resources across all our communities that will be distributed and accessible um, for, for parents, for teachers, um, and for students. Um, and so because this group is about um, stepping back, being a larger resource for for um, our staff and family so that they can connect families with those resources. Another key priority and goal for this group is to develop a plan for communication. So in crisis response, it's incredibly important. As you can see here, we have these, um, several, um, these several open forums for our stakeholder groups to learn just even about what we're thinking. As Dr. Lupini said at the beginning, we may not have the answers, but um, it's, it can alleviate a lot of stress and anxiety to be just this transparent and communicate all of this information to people. So this is one example of how uh, we're going to um, communicate to our stakeholders. Um, in addition, it means um, providing recommendations to the safety and security task force, CECOS care team as it pertains to behavioral emotional health. Um, and then also to um, establish the crisis response mechanism for ongoing. And this is something that we started to do even before we knew what COVID-19 was. We were about to get up and running and then um, this hit. So that means identifying a crisis coordinator who is Raymond Pillsbury, uh, Director of Student Services at uh, Winnicott High School. 
Um, but the next steps will be to, to create a crisis response team that would support all districts by identifying a couple key people in each school, get them through some training this summer, and then thereby having ongoing training to have a consistent response to these crises, as I mentioned, to this pandemic and beyond. So that is, in a nutshell, what we've been talking about for mental health and wellness over the past month or so in, in my group. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Any questions for Dr. Eckstein? There was a participant that had a comment um, oh. about students in a stifled environment wearing PPC, PPE and uh, whether or not they could be outside. And I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss that. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's been a, do you want to comment on that at all, Carolyn? Well, certainly there are several factors to that, that we need to, to that will just, whether we take into consideration or not, it will be, it'll be prevalent as far as, you know, there'll be some students who don't tolerate masks. There'll be some students who have, um, who have um, issues with breathing. There will be some students who, um, they may have hearing impairments or speech impairments, so it, it, they won't be intelligible while wearing masks. Um, so I, I don't, I certainly don't have the answers to those things to to answer to take care of all those issues while keeping kids safe from a from a virus. I don't know the answers to that. I think we did consider some um, face shields at one point for some teachers and staff. Um, so I think we need to have all of these options on the table because we will be, we will be, um, we will be faced with them for different kinds of kids with different kinds of needs. Thanks. Anyone else for Caroline? All right. Thank you very much. We'll go on to Jason. Mr. Saltmarsh. Yes. Hi. Um, I think I know most of you, but it's it's good to meet all of you. My name is Jason Saltmarsh. I'm the IT director at Winnicott High School. Um, so as the IT department, I kind of think of our group as the peanut butter in the remote learning sandwich. So we've got our teachers and we've got our students. They're not in the same place. And somehow we have to make sure that connection occurs. Um, so to that end, a lot of what we discussed was just making that happen logistically and making sure that every child had the opportunity to engage in um, education. So uh, Dr. Lupini said earlier that COVID-19 had been an accelerant. He's absolutely right. Um, in what I've seen with technology adoption, uh, COVID-19 has been an accelerant and a catalyst to educational technology at whole institutions. So we have seen teachers who are willing to run with it or small groups or grade levels, but it's very rare that you see an entire institution, school or district that suddenly embraces something to do with technology and just runs with it full force. Um, and that's what COVID-19 did. It, turned it into something that was, you know, an embellishment or an addition to regular instruction, and it made it the center of instruction. And so for us, that was a little overwhelming, but also really exciting at the same time. Um, and fortunately for this district, we had ourselves positioned pretty well in terms of computer access for our students. At the high school, we've had a one-to-one -one program for some time, and we have pretty high ratios in our K-8 through programs as well. And so that, that really helped us out quite a bit. Um, there are other districts that were not as lucky, and it was much harder for them to try to develop some kind of stable remote learning um, environment. So the number one thing that we have discussed, and we kind of banged our heads against the wall, because this is a frustrating point, the digital divide still exists. So we have those who have internet access at home, we have those who have okay access, and we have some that are just not connected. And so our solution to that was to purchase some hotspots for students and families that could not connect. Um, and these hotspots run over a cellular signal and they use Verizon as a uh, provider. And what we found is that even providing hotspots to these families wasn't enough because oftentimes they were in a place where they could not get a cell signal. Um, and to complicate matters, many times the students who are in this situation are the same ones that don't have much of a voice when it comes for reaching out and asking for assistance. 
Um, there's not always a lot of advocacy for these people. So um, we'd like to do something to fix that. Uh, but we're up against, you know, an industry that is not modeled to work that way. So I was pleased to hear last week, the governor announced that there's a $50 million initiative to try to bring broadband that last mile in New Hampshire. And I'm hoping that that means some of the families in our communities will have broadband available to them, those that do not now. Um, but stay tuned, because I don't know any more than you do at this point about that initiative. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, families that have their own devices, and we have some families that don't. Um, it's different for each community. And we found that when we engaged in discussions, there were teachers, administrators, other tech personnel on these committees, there's parents as well. And when we discuss some of these topics, it can be very different based on the school that the student attends. Um, not everything is equal. And so that's one of the things about our district that makes it interesting um, is the fact that we have many different parties that we cater to. And so one solution doesn't always work. So we built in a little flexibility to our, our plans so that each community and each school can react a little bit differently given their circumstances. Um, we kicked around the idea of Wi-Fi in the parking lots of the schools. So we have access points in our schools. The family could pull up in a car, they'd have access to Wi-Fi, but then uh, it went back to, you know, we have the same problem where some of the families that need the Wi-Fi might not have a, a vehicle to get to the school or they might not have multiple vehicles so their child could be at the school. And um, so that's one we still struggle with a bit. Uh, some other things that we wish we could have done better this time around are technical support in the home. So we are in kind of a tricky situation as an IT department when it comes to tech support in the home because each place is different. They have a different environment. They may have different providers and different types of computers in their home. And so it's very hard for us to suggest that they make changes to their home environment uh, because ultimately we will then own all of the tech issues in that household for the foreseeable future because they'll say, you told us to do this. Um, so we try to help where we can, but, but it, it is difficult to try to provide really good support um, for every family in every circumstance, but we certainly try our best to do so. Um, <clears throat> we did put out a survey to uh, high school students, teachers, K through 12, as well as parents K through 12 to find out their responses to how, how, how did they think it went? Where did they need more help? What did we do well? And interestingly enough, there were some common themes among all of those stakeholder groups. Because uh, I, I had expected maybe the high school students would give us a different uh, response than maybe the K-8 teachers did, but it remarkably was very similar. So the things that they asked for in terms of better IT support were number one, organization. So paring down the number of apps and platforms and things that we use to make things simpler for parents and students at home. So there weren't 10 different places to look to find out what exactly was expected of the student that week. Instead, they want to have one central management solution or learning management solution where everything can be kept. So the student has a dashboard and they log in and all the resources are there and the parent can easily look over their shoulder and see what's in front of them for that week. Um, they were not, not happy with school by email, which is an awful thing to say, but um, it's very hard for them to track the number of emails that were coming in throughout the day. And it looked or seemed as if the younger the student is, the more um, difficulty they have with email communications. Um, another thing that they asked for um, is some type of um, schedule that's predictable. So in the beginning, I think, you know, and Dave talked about this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I think in the beginning, flexibility was seen as a good thing for all of the families and all the circumstances that we had to um, support. But a lot of the kids and the teachers asked for some kind of a standardized expectation or a schedule so that they, they could adhere to that. I have a child at the high school myself who is going to be a junior next year. And I saw his bedtime creep up night after night and the time he got up in the morning creeped up day after day until he was getting up at 11 and he was going to bed at midnight. 
and um, his schedule just started to fall apart. So if other parents out there had the same situation, then you can understand how a schedule might be uh, beneficial for, for a child like that. Um, the other piece that they said they wanted all of them across the board was more live interaction between student and teacher. This was repeated over and over by all of the groups in the survey. Um, that need for live interaction so that the teacher gets a response from the student, the student gets a response from the teacher. There is so much about education, which goes to trust and caring. And then you can't develop trust and you can't develop a caring relationship unless it's a two way street. And so having that teacher react to the student and know that, um, you know, they care and they're there and they're listening. I think that is um, something we cannot diminish as far as its importance goes. That's something we have that we take for granted in face to face learning, but in remote learning, you have to go the extra, you know, the extra step to make sure that that still occurs. Um, we also heard that remote learning cannot replace traditional learning. And so our priority remains, you know, to return to school as safe as possible, as soon as possible, as soon as it's safe to get back, we will go back. But until that time, um, these are all lessons learned that are going to help the IT department and maybe some of the others make good decisions about what remote learning could look like. Uh, the, uh, the request to make things simpler has resulted in the SAU looking at a toolbox of applications so that we can say that we have a primary set of applications which has been approved by the district, supported by the district, and complies with data privacy requirements. And teachers would know that if they pick an app on this list, it's something that's, you know, it, it's okay to use and that we will help them use it. One thing that happened with the onset of remote learning, it became a scramble for multiple online vendors to throw free products at the schools, hoping that teachers would use them and then perhaps decide to hold on to them once this period was over. So it was kind of like, have a, have a little taste and see if you like it, if you do, there's more where that came from. Um, not a good scenario when you're trying to manage IT across a district. So proper vetting and, and putting these things together in one collection, I think will help immensely for all parties involved. And let's see, finally, we found that we need to stop purchasing desktops at the school. We are going to focus on buying mobile equipment like laptops and touchscreen devices. It's very hard for, you know, an administrative assistant who's working from home to walk home with a desktop. Not real easy to do. So um, I thought about that a little bit and I don't know why we bought the desktops. It seemed like the thing to do. Maybe it was a little bit cheaper and that made sense at the time. But given the fact that things are in flux right now and people are in and out of the building so often, I think we finally reached the point where Mobile devices are, are probably what we're going to do going forward unless we're in a you know, dedicated lab environment that requires a desktop. And finally, I would like to say we did a good job, I think, uh, supporting the teachers and the students. I don't think we did as well as we could have in supporting the parents. And um, it's evident in talking to the K-8 teachers and um, staff in particular that kids struggled at home and parents struggled at home trying to help their kids. So we will pay special attention to trying to create tutorials and resources that are for the purpose of helping parents deal with remote learning and helping them support their own children in their house. And that's kind of my executive summary of where we're at. There are some other details. Um, I th believe my working plan has probably been made available to you. And you're, you know, I'm, I'll take questions any day, any night, you know, call me, email me, whatever, I'm happy to respond. But um, if you have anything right now, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Thanks, Jason. Anything for Jason? <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Farrar. Well, I, I think we've reached our allotted time, so I'm happy to field any questions. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to make this brief, um, you know, seeing as how I am finishing up the evening. Um, so, I, so I was fortunate to work with a, a really great team um, to, to develop an 
operations um, related um, you know plan or, or I guess recommendations that we're considering at this point in time um, you know so I do want to take this opportunity to, to thank all those committee members um, they, they really put a lot of time and effort um, into developing um, a, a really um, cogent flexible um, plan um, considering all the uncertainty and um, and the fact that this will this is a working document that will um, evolve um, as we um, have a better understanding of um, you know what um, what the guidance and the guidelines that we're working under um, will be. Um, so we, we we were we did work under um, some guiding principles um, really to provide uh, for you know safety, equity, flexibility, and transparency while. Um, trying to be pragmatic and, um, and, and consider the fiscal component. Um, you know, really we, um, you know, from an operational standpoint, um, that these are, these are issues that affect, um, you know, all of our students and all of our staff. Um, so we, we, we try to maintain, um, you know, or, or, or really consider how this affects, um, those stakeholders. Um, also, I just want to note that we developed these recommendations um, based on the current information, the, the current research and guidelines um, that is available to us. Um, so this will continue to evolve as we receive further guidance uh, from the CDC and from, from the state. So with that, with that in mind, um, we did develop some overarching goals um, that are specific to food service, um, facilities, transportation, and athletics. Um, those include ensuring that we maintain essential function of school, school dining services um, while mitigating um, risk for our students and staff. Um, we also want to ensure that our schools are properly sanitized and disinfected um, when schools do reopen. Um, and to continue that sanitation on a, a daily basis, or at, at least a daily basis. Um, because because in, in many of these, you know, um, guidelines that we're seeing, um, that sanitizing isn't necessarily daily. It's more on an as-needed basis, hourly basis, um, depending on, um, you know, what the, 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 um, what the area is. Um, we also want to ensure that our staff and personnel follow the proper protocol and guidelines um, for uh, gathering and wearing PPE. Um, we want to ensure that our um, that we have the proper procedures in place um, for screening of any staff, students, and um, visitors um, who will be um, visiting or will be in an SAU 21 school. Um, we would, um, we, do, we want to ensure that um, all of our students um, have received timely and safe passage to and from school. Um, as, and, and in that vein, um, ensure that any buses or school vehicles are properly sanitized and disinfected um, on a daily basis. Finally, our last overarching goal is to ensure that students um, safely participate in interscholastic athletics, um, both on the practice field and during competitions um, when school resumes. Um, so again, all of these recommendations and processes um, will be monitored on an ongoing basis. Um, and that's really to ensure that we are always following um, the guidelines that are that are set forth, um, and there's a number of organizations um, that we we do need to um, to um, follow those their guidance, and that includes the CDC, USDA for food service, DOT, Department of Transportation for um, for our transportation, um, of course the Department of Education, NHIAA for athletics, um, DHHS, um, and then the general state and federal um, guidelines. Um, so I, I also want to reiterate that any recommendations that we bring forth um, at this level is, is an SAU-wide or SAU-level guidance. 
Um, so each, you know, this, this is the, the first step. So um, each individual school will, will have its own unique is from an operational standpoint, um, you know, whether that's staffing, um, whether it's the physical space perspective or, or even a financial perspective. Um, as such, each school um, will, be, will be developing its, their own specific um, individualized action plan um, based on these higher level recommendations. Um, so we did delineate um, our recommendations um, based on the three scenarios of either in school, remote, or a hybrid approach. Um, however, from an operational standpoint, um, most of the recommendations come into play if, if school is in session um, or if it's a, a hybrid or a rolling closure um, perspective. Um, so I'll, I'll really um, touch upon the, the significant um, recommendations or what we're looking at. Um, if we have students in the school, students and staff in the school. Um, oh, so I guess right off the bat, I will note that the major challenge for an in-person um, scenario is the social distancing. Um, so, I mean, bottom line is we, we don't have the necessary space in our facilities um, nor the number of buses um, to maintain the current social distancing guidance of six feet. Um, you know, our typical classroom can accommodate, you know, approximately nine students um, plus a teacher. Um, and our typical 80 person bus can accommodate approximately 13 students and a bus driver. Um, so that's an issue. Um, um, th this, this does not even account for students, you know, proclivity to gather together or interact and generally be in close proximity um, to each other, um, which, which is a whole nother issue and from a, you know, a, a supervision management perspective. Um, so, so as such, social distancing is a major concern and it is an obstacle for any type of in-person model, um, particularly from the, that operation standpoint. So um, that being said, um, should guidance on social distancing be relaxed? Um, you know, we, we do have recommendations um, for those four um, operational areas, food service facilities, transportation, and, and athletics. Um, so again, um, I won't go into great detail, but I will, I'll just kind of go over some of our made, some of the, um, some of the areas that we're looking at um, in, in, the, in these four areas. So this includes creating, you know, a master meal schedule for our students um, in the classroom setting. Um, so we're, we're trying to avoid large gatherings. So that would include the cafeteria. Um, so this, this would include the necessary logistics um, and I'll note the necessary staffing um, to deliver the meals to the classroom um, and then to supervise those students while they're eating their lunch in the classroom um, because of, of course our, our teachers are, um, you know as well as accommodating an allergen free area in the classroom um, and then cleaning and disposal of that trash um, after lunch um, you know that you know eating in the classroom seems like a basic function however you'll note all of those items I just mentioned is, um, is logistically um, fairly complex um, and, and potentially um, financially, um, you know, a, a, a financial hit. Um, so we would also consider, you know, online lunch ordering as well as changing our free and reduced lunch program application process um, to an online, fully online process um, removing the paper-based approach. Um, we would need to have our food service staff to work with our facilities team to ensure proper sanitation and disinfection um, of our kitchen area and all of our equipment. Um, you know, we'd have to look at our process for vendors um, sa safely delivering um, any food or supplies to our schools. Um, we'd be looking at our staffing processes um, 
and, and the proper handling of food, um, cross-training our staff, um, as well as ensuring adequate backup staffing. Um, you know, we'd, we'd take a look at, um, you know, consideration of financial support for, for, for food service, for any students that do not qualify for a free and reduced um, lunch program, but may be struggling from a financial standpoint um, during this crisis. Um, there would likely be a streamlined food menu, um, you know, due to um, the delivery um, and logistics involved with eating in the classrooms, um, as well as limitation of any type of, you know, self-service um, food and drink stations. Um, additionally, we'd be looking at Did Matt freeze? Yeah, it looks like mm -hmm. it. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, he did. He's back. I'm sorry? You had frozen up, Matt. Okay, uh, am I oh. back? You are. Yes. <laughs> all right, um, that was by design. Um, just, just start over. All the, all the important stuff just I just said. So did you hear the, so we'll be using paper product usage um, in the food service um as opposed to reusable products um, and then i was moving on to facilities um, so from a facilities perspective we'd be looking to implement a daily and nightly um, disinfecting and sanitizing schedule um, from our custodial staff as well as um you know as needed during the day um, as what we will also be looking to implement a plan um, to properly train our facility staff um, for that cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting. And I will say um, that really goes across the board for all of our departments. Um, from a training perspective, we really do need to look at providing training um, on all these operational issues um, across um, all of our schools and departments. Um, you know, we'd also um, look to create standard procedures um, for you know, hand cleaning, sanitizing, um, every time a student or staff member were to enter and exit um, a classroom, a building, or an office. Um, you know, it's, it's important to, it'll be important to implement a procedure for all of our students, staff, or visitors um, to conduct a self-screening prior to entering any SAU um, 21 school building. Um, and then we'd also consider um, a, a verbal screening process um, for students and staff entering any building. Um, we, would, um, we would look to provide some type of isolated areas for, for staff or students who have um, any presented symptoms um, during the school day. Um, Further, um, the CDC has advised um, to require all staff and school visitors, um, as well as recommend any students and children over the age of two to wear the appropriate face coverings um, if possible um, while, while they are on school property. Um, we would be looking to implement a plan to ensure that all staff and school visitors um, um, do practice as much social distancing as is possible on school. Like I said, it's, it is impossible to maintain that six feet um, of social distancing with the current space, but we would look at providing signage, floor markings, et cetera, um, to maintain as much distance as possible. Um, we would look to create procedures for our students to, um, to minimize the number of belongings um, and staff to minimize the number of belongings they bring um, to school. We'd limit locker usage um, and try to maximize um, communication electronically or via phone um, for our, our parents. Um, you know, from a staffing perspective, we need to assess um, our, our personnel's willingness to return to work, um, as well as our students, 
willingness or family's willingness to return to school. Um, and, and this also includes identifying some critical job functions, um, you know, as well as providing any cross training for certain roles where we, where we do see some risk. Um, you know, we'll, we'll need to look at the appropriate attendance, sick leave, FMLA process for our staff. Um, and, and finally, from a facility standpoint, we'd want to um, take a look at, uh, or not, not take a look, we are in the process of purchasing an electronic fingerprint scanner. Um, this is to conduct our criminal background checks um, for any staff that we hire or any parent volunteers, et cetera. That's, it's, it's unfortunately with fingerprinting, that's a pretty um, close, um, high contact process currently. Um, so that's something that we just need to um, change immediately. So we are in the process of procuring um, that, that scanner so that we can continue with hiring and um, the volunteer background check process. Um, so from a transportation perspective, um, you know, we'll be looking to send out a survey um, to our parents um, and our, our, or our and guardians um, to estimate ridership levels this summer. Um, again, this, this is important when we're looking at that social distancing requirements and how many students we can get um, onto a bus. Um, currently, we're not allowed to install any type of plexiglass barrier in buses. Um, this, this is, um, you know, this is something that we were looking at, um, but we are monitoring the guidance from the Department of Transportation as far as any type of bus modification that we can do in order to increase our ridership capacities. Um, you know, we'll be looking at a procedure for daily bus sanitizing, um, as well as signage on buses and, and notification to parents of the, of the safety guidelines on the bus while their students are, are on the bus. Um, and then, and then also applying that to any school-owned vehicles. We have a number of vans that we utilize, um, so those those procedures will apply to to those vehicles as well as our you know our daily routes, our special education, athletic field trips, um, as well as our and homeless transportation. Um, you know, we we'd have to consider um, you know making some slight adjustments. Um, to stagger our routes on um, timing, um, you know, and making small changes such as, you know, encouraging, you know, our buses to keep their windows open as often as possible, you know, for the two weeks that we have nice weather during the school year. Um, we would look to um, work with our police departments um, and our school staff um, to, to really take a close look at our traffic flow for drop off and pickup times um, and, and consider staggering that time frame um, to separate the buses and the parents and, and you know, at Winnicott, our students um, to minimize, um, you know, larger congregations of students. Um, and finally, from a transportation standpoint, um, we would like to develop some um, parent guidelines um, regarding carpooling, um, drop off, um, you know, high school students riding together, um, and, you know, transportation to athletic games, because that, that, those are all areas that kind of fall under that purview um, that, that we would be looking to make adjustments to. Um, so um, should athletics occur, which again is an NHIAA decision, um, we would follow similar, um, you know, we would follow those guidelines from HIA um, and CDC, similar to the buildings. Um, you know, we'd be looking at social distancing um, on our benches and our sidelines. Um, so this could involve adding multiple benches, requiring masks or face coverings on the sidelines um, and to extend bench areas. You know, we would consider requiring masks um, for spectators. Um, and we'd, we'd also look at marking our bleachers um, with, you know, six foot intervals. 
Um, you know, it, it'd be, um, we're, we're going to try to um, maximize our, um, you know, our live streaming of any of these events um, whenever possible so that parents can watch from home. Um, additionally, we'd, um, we'd, we'd look at closing our locker rooms um, and requiring our athletes to, you know, transport their own, you know, equipment um, to and from the field, um, you know, on a daily basis. Um, you know, finally, again, we'd look at implementing sanitizing and disinfecting of, of all of our athletic supplies and equipment. So, so that, that's kind of a quick rundown of many of the, the items that we're looking at and, um, you know, the considerations that we'd, we'd have if we were approaching an in-person school operation. Again, when considering these recommendations, we need, really need to keep in mind that the structure and the process will, will it'll need to be different for elementary, middle, and high school. Um, and that's based on, you know, the, the different structures related to physical space, um, their schedules, um, the financial impact, and the staffing levels. So, um, you know, these were the, these are kind of the high level guidance. Um, and again, this 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 is a working document which will change as we hear more from our governor. Um, but it will go to an even granular, more granular level once it gets to that school specific level, um, which will address these operational pieces. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions on operations. I believe we have one minute. <laughs> uh, thanks, Matt. Um, one thing on, because I know we've been asked about this a lot. We, in terms of athletics, those decisions will be made by the NHIAA. We do hear from time to time that there are conversations about moving sports to different seasons. There are conversations about running some sports that have less or no contact and not running sports that do have con So they're not having a strict, will there be a fall season or not conversation. It's, it's very, from what we understand, it's very differentiated with, within sports um, in, individually by themselves. And the whole thing that Matt didn't mention, you know, that we, that we would love to have in place because way back in the beginning, there was a lot of conversation about would we have testing available at schools for people coming to school and there were a lot of people early on who were saying without tests you can't reopen this or you can't reopen that and so we're still looking for what will the guidance be on that what will the availability be of of testing how would that be administered all those kinds of things along with with what matt's laid out for you any questions for matt we've worn you out huh no. I felt all optimistic until Matt spoke. <laughs> you know, I, I did too. I did too. It's, it's, felt optimistic agree, until... I mean, to giving the current guidelines and giving, I mean, just the issue of transportation. Right. The, you know, the back to school task force. I think when we say that to people, that's all they hear is back to school. Uh, and I think we need to make it very clear that given the current situation that might be almost impossible to do so we might just start off with remote learning until we do have um, a better solution to COVID itself as a country or as a world uh, over yeah we try to figure out these things and I think we all need to be a little more flexible I would love to know today right now on what August is going to look like end of August for my uh, for our Northampton school, are we going to go back? Are we not? But I think we all need to be a little flexible on that in waiting and finding out what the guidelines are, where we fit in. I mean, just our little rec department of Northampton, uh, one day, no, we can't do it. Forward three days, oh, yes, we can. Um, different changes happen weekly. So I think we just kind of maybe, I understand we want to be up front and, um, leading edge of decision making but sometimes we just have to wait it out and make it a last minute decision no that's right and the purpose of these is really just to to lay out the kinds of things that we're talking about right and that we're seeing not to say we have any decisions you're, you're exactly right we've we've tried to lay out we, we clearly our goal is to come back to school but matt said to you a classroom will hold 10 people 
right? A bus will hold 13 people. Yeah. So we, we don't have, we can't pick up twice as many rooms as we have now. And I don't think we have budgets to pick up twice as many teachers. So now what? Yeah, right. we're seeing more buses. <laughs> right, right. So, so that, those are the things we're confronting if, if the parameters continue to be what they, what they are right now. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we have to get into what would change them and would people be comfortable with what kinds of decision making might go into changing them. Yeah. Well, we'll see. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Thank you, Matt. And so we're, as I said, we're going to do this with our employees tomorrow morning. We're going to, um, we're going to be a little bit more succinct and maybe change the order a little or the change the, uh, uh, the, the order of questions and that kind of thing. And then we're going to do a community session with SAU 90 tomorrow evening. So if you want to hear some of this again, please join us. And if you have any questions, please just let, let one of the six of us uh, know. And I just, again, want to applaud the work of these, these five people who've just done a great work with these, great job with these working groups um, and all of the people who volunteered to be part of this. And we, I, I, I haven't, I haven't counted them all up, but I think we're, we're close to 100 people are involved in one, one aspect or another of this work, and we really appreciate all that. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think Motion to adjourn. Thank you. I second. And I think, uh, I don't even know if Rhonda's on, right? Oh, there, there. there she is. We can just wave. <laughs> all right, sounds good. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great work, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.